The big three-way offensive operations of the Ukrainian army, including Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Crimea, greatly disrupted the Russian invasion plans, especially in the last days. The breaking moments in the Velikanovo Silka front line in Zaporizhia Oblast resulted in the Ukrainians saving seven settlements. With the liberation of these cities by the Ukrainians, the Russian troops in the south of Zaporizhia Velikanovo Silka began to flee towards Niskichny, Storjev, Blahardane, and Mikievka. The Russians took their last breath in Starmal Yorka, which is located in the south of Munkivka. In addition, the settlement of origin on the eastern side of the city turned into a center of deployment for the Russian troops fleeing from Velikanovo Silka. On the other hand, another axis of attack of the Ukrainians was rapidly advancing southwest of Velikanovo Silka. Russian troops in Novojorgievka and Livadia, which were among the seven settlements liberated by the Ukrainian army, were completely pushed out of these areas. When the Russian troops who were completely out of the game between these two cities had no other option, Moscow turned its attention to the soldiers who fled to the south of Makarovka. This Russian group was holding defensive positions on the Staromainsky and Axis, as we mentioned. But the Ukrainian army's assault brigades, infantry units, and tank brigades of M1, Bradley, and Leopard 2s were heading towards the Russians who were standing on the Staromestska and Aruzgan front line. In fact, even Moscow was waiting for such an offensive operation because it was impossible to stop this. The Russian troops, whose defense collapsed to Aruzgan, were almost waiting for the Ukrainians to come to the city and declare war on them. Finally noticing this gap recently, the Ukrainian assault troops arrived in the city of Aruzgan and launched an unbelievable attack on the Russian forces in this front line. While the Leopard 2 battle tanks were advancing with artillery attacks in Orozhain, the Ukrainian infantry units were hunting the Russians from the landline on the safe route where the artillery fire took place. After long hours of fierce clashes, the Russian troops in Oruzgin were compelled to raise the white flag, and as a result, the Ukrainian armed forces liberated Oruzgin from the Russians. With the liberation of the city, the number of settlements cleared by the Ukrainians from the Russians as part of the Zaporizhia offensive operations increased to eight, with the eighth settlement on the Zaporizhia front line cleared of Russians. The Resistance Russian military groups in this area were either destroyed during the Ukrainian offensive or fled from the clash area. It was claimed that the fleeing troops were now heading to the southwest of Staromainsky because Russia has defensive fortifications in this area up to the city of Ramaka. But these defensive fortifications are not strong enough to withstand the offensive operations of the Ukrainian troops. If the Russians are not able to direct reinforcements to these rescue areas, it would not be a surprise if the Ukrainian forces advance as far as Ramaka. In addition, the way to attack Ramaka from the northern line is gradually opening as the offensive of the Ukrainians still continues in the direction of Rivenbill. These offensive operations are also supported by Ukrainian troops in Novojorgievka and Lavagna. Since these two cities were liberated, Ukrainians can also easily reach Arivnia Bill from the west side. Moscow, on the other hand, remains silent after repeated Ukrainian victories. Even some Russian bloggers and pro-Moscow war analysts are aware of the critical situation in Zaporizhia. While Russian leader Vladimir Putin and Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu still ignore the advance of the Ukrainian army in Zaporizhia, Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister, Anna Malyar, states that Kiev forces are still carrying out counterattack operations in at least three directions. In their latest statement, Mali announced on Telegram that it has gained between 650 and 1600 FT in sectors of the Bakhmut front line in Donetsk Oblast, Ukraine and between 980 to 1150 FD in pots of the Zaporizhia direction. The Ukrainian Tavria Forces Group stated that the troops advancing in the direction of Zaporizhia are critical in complicating the Ukrainian attacks on this part of the front and prioritizing hitting Russian electronic warfare systems. In addition, the Ukrainian Tavrysky Group of Forces noted that the Kiev forces continued their counterattack on the northeast, northwest, and southwest outskirts of Bakhmut. Ukrainian and Russian sources reported that clashes continued in the west of Donetsk, especially around Makarovka and west of Zaporizhia. Anna Malyar, on the other hand, explained that heavy rain and bad weather did not affect Ukraine's progress as Russian mill bloggers reported. But some analysts believe it's too early to assess the effectiveness of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, which began last week. 
But if we consider what has happened so far on the Zaporizhia Donetsk front line, we are faced with the fact that it may now be possible to say something. While not conclusive, these critical facts indicate that the Russian defenses are slowly collapsing on the Ukrainian southern front lines. Russia, on the other hand, started an attempt to increase its missile attacks in response to the progress of the Ukrainians in the Zaporizhia steppes. Missile attacks occurred in President Zelensky's hometown of Kriviri as a result of these attacks, while Russia could not make any significant gains. Three Ukrainian civilians lost their lives while the Russians were trying to divert the attention of the Ukrainian advance in Zaporizhia in a different direction. Kiev's determined stance on this issue revealed everything. In other words, these striking offensive operations on Ukraine's critical front lines between Zaporizhia and Donetsk seem to be talked about more despite the efforts of the Russian authorities. So who is in charge of these offensive operations of the Ukrainians? And how are these attacks progressing in such a coordinated way? A key figure in the planning and execution of this operation is Ukraine's 49-year-old commander-in-chief, General Valery Zelezhny. Although little has been known until recently, his popularity now rivals that of President Vladimir Zelensky. General Zelezhny, or as his friends and former classmates like to call him, Valera, was appointed commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian army in July 2021. Those who knew him well said that the appointment made by President Zelensky himself surprised the general and many others because his promotion only involved climbing a few career ranks. Zelensky was already known as an ambitious and modern commander, but he was also a modest man who liked to joke with his subordinates and was not showing off. But what he has currently accomplished in Zaporizhia is no joke. Born into the family of a Soviet soldier, Valery Zelezhny once stated that he was always determined to distance himself from the extreme hierarchy of the Soviet army. When we look at the battlefield in Ukraine, we can see that Valery Zelezhny has more than achieved this. So how did this legendary Ukrainian commander succeed in capturing eight cities in Zaporizhia in such a short time? Lyudmil Ulanovskaya Zelezhny, his former deputy who has been with him since the first days of the Russian occupation, said in a statement on the subject that the legendary Ukrainian commander hardly sleeps and is in constant communication with the military personnel at the front. Analysts believe that the flexibility displayed by junior officers and the Ukrainian units who can make decisions on the battlefield give them a significant advantage over the top-heavy decision-making structures of the Russian army. Some sources in the Ukrainian military even go as far as to say that it is the decisive commanders on the ground who are collectively responsible for Ukraine's success. But according to General Zelezhny, this success can only be achieved if his army leaves its soldiers the freedom of operation. In summary, when we examine the structure of the Ukrainian army between the command and the soldiers, we can understand how eight settlements in Zaporizhia easily got rid of the Russians and why the Russians were constantly unsuccessful on the other front lines, despite their military strength. In other words, volunteering is essential on the road to victory, not necessity. Concepts such as patriotism and freedom overcome all fears and oppression. The counterattack launched by the Ukrainian armed forces has inflamed both the agenda and the conflicts on the front lines. The long awaited counterattacks made the Russian forces very nervous. The mobility in the east and south axis of Ukraine is increasing day by day. The Kiev troops set their sights on the southern front while southern Ukraine recovers. Kiev troops will be able to focus on Crimea more easily to isolate Crimea and make it untenable to Russian forces. Ukraine must use long-range weapons. To put this in perspective, from coastal location between Melitopol, Berdyansk and even Mariupol, the prestigious Crimean bridge near Kerch can be reached with long-range weapons. The same will be true of Russian positions on the Crimean coast up to the Sea of Azov and possibly Sevastopol, where the Russian Black Sea Fleet is stationed. In addition, in recent days, when counterattack operations have gained momentum, Ukrainian forces continue to carry out daring attacks on strategic areas. The focal point of these attacks is the Black Sea Peninsula. The direction of the Ukrainian attacks was diverted to the Russian radar station in Crimea. The other day, a Russian radar station used to control Ukraine's southern coast and most of the Black Sea was damaged in temporarily occupied Crimea. Satellite images of a Russian radar station located on the Takhano Peninsula on the west coast of Crimea have emerged. As the Telegram channel Partisans of Crimea reported, the pictures show a hole in the dome of the station. 
In fact, these are the eyes that control the entire southern coast of Ukraine and a significant part of the Black Sea. Destroying these eyes could mean significantly weakening Russian troops, aviation, and air defense. Crimea is often hit by Ukraine. On June 11, an explosion occurred on the Jankwe Kerch railway section in Crimea. Donskoy is a rail and road hub in northern Crimea, about 80 kilometers south of the Ukrainian mainland. At the same time, Tsenkov is a critical node in Russia's supply network. Ukrainian planners know this. Therefore, Tsenkov is currently one of the main targets of Ukraine's long counter-logistical campaign. Donskoy is located on the main railway line from southern Russia, crossing the bridge over the Kerch Strait to northern Crimea and southern Kherson Oblast on the left bank of the Dnipro. Armed with U.S.-made high-motion artillery rocket systems and the latest European mortars, Ukrainian forces began shelling Russian supply lines. The counter-logistical campaign peaked on October 8 when Ukrainian saboteurs triggered a truck bomb that badly damaged the Kerch Bridge, where previously the bridge had two high-capacity rail lines. Now it only has one line, and its capacity is probably lower to make up for this. The Russians ship more supplies to the Crimea and southern Ukraine. After entering the Crimea, these materials are still transported by rail and road and pass through Xi'an. Koi. The fact that these supply routes are also frequently attacked by Ukraine affects the Russian logistics chain. While the Black Sea Peninsula is shaken by the Ukrainian attacks, the Russians continue their preparations for war. Kiev military intelligence agency Gur said Russia was preparing a man-made disaster at the Titan chemical plant in Crimea. According to the GOR, Russian forces are mining at the plant's workshops in Armyansk in the north of the Black Sea Peninsula in Armyansk. The Russians are preparing to evacuate both the representatives of the occupation administration and the local population. Gore reported that as a result of the collapse of Novokakovka last week and the subsequent lack of water in the North Crimean Canal, production processes at the Crimean Titan plant in Army Ansk were critically interrupted. According to the Gore, the Russians consider it impossible to restart operations at a minimally acceptable level. There are also reports of the potential shutdown of the Crimean Titan plant on Army Ansk territory. Simultaneously, the fortification units of the Moscow Army are placing mines in the workshops of the active enterprise, while at the same time placing explosives both in the factory and in the environment. The attack on the Crimean Titan enterprise, for which Russian troops are preparing will mean an artificial man-made disaster. The consequences of which are terrible. It was stated that the refrigeration equipment of the facility used approximately 200 tons of ammonia. Gore stated that in case of an explosion at the facility, an ammonia cloud can cover the surrounding areas within half an hour. Gore added that Army Ansk, the Krasnoparakovsk region of Crimea, and the southern regions of Ukraine's Kherson region will be under threat. So what's been happening on the Ukrainian front line lately? The Zaporizhia Separate Territorial Defense Brigade reports that it has liberated the Novogorgievka village in southeast Zaporizhia Oblast. The village is about 100 kilometers from Mariupol on the Sea of Azov and 110 kilometers from Berdyansk. The 35th Separate Marine Brigade of the Ukrainian Navy announced that it had liberated the village of Storajev in the southwestern Donetsk Oblast. Storajev is next to Blatidate, which was reportedly rescued earlier. The Ministry of Defense of Ukraine reported that two more villages, Niskichny and Markarova, were liberated in the same region. Three villages on the West Bank fell one after another over the weekend as Ukrainian forces appeared to be advancing along the river and towards the coastal city of Mariupol, about 70 miles southeast. A successful advance would effectively detach Russian forces in the eastern conflict zones from the Crimean Peninsula, where all their supplies come from Russia. Russian officials said their troops largely held their positions and did not confirm the withdrawal from the three villages. But Semyon Pegov, a well-known Russian military blogger under the pseudonym War Gonzo, acknowledged that Russian troops had withdrawn from Blahadeh, Niskichny and Makarovka. Semyon Pegov said that Ukrainian forces are trying to advance along the banks of the Mercury Ali River. The latest news from the front line shows that the advancing Ukrainian troops are now fighting the Russians in the northern suburbs of the village of Staromansky, just below the newly liberated Mikievka. In addition, the retreating Russian forces destroyed another dam just a week after the explosion at the Kakovka hydroelectric station.
Ukrainian forces are making incremental gains in the Donetsk Zaporizhia border areas, which appears to be the beginning of an attempt to cut the Russian land bridge between Crimea and Putin's eastern forces in Donbass. Meanwhile, Moscow's fleeing troops are accused of bombing another dam as rescue and relief efforts in the Kherson region enter its seventh day. The Russian military appears to be doubling down on its tactic of destroying critical infrastructure on the front line. Ukrainian military officials said that Russian forces demolished the dam further south along the Mokreya River when they reached the crossing point in an attempt to complicate Ukraine's advance. The dam, considerably smaller than the Kakovka hydroelectric power station, is located near the village of Kleshchev, about 16 kilometers south of where Ukraine and Russia are currently fighting. Valery Shershin, the Ukrainian military spokesman for this part of the front, said that the dam above the river was blown up, causing flooding on both sides of the river. Russian troops first blew up the Karlov Reservoir and then the Kakovka hydroelectric power station, then other hydraulic structures in the occupied part of the Zaporizhia region. Russian troops are waiting for the breakthrough of the Ukrainian defense forces in the Zaporizhia region. Therefore, Russians again blew up the hydraulic structure on the Mercury Ali River to slow the advance of the Ukrainian forces. Valery Cherkin added that the destruction will not affect the advance of the Ukrainian forces, which are moving rapidly in the region. As a result, the Ukrainian counteroffensive continues unabated. There are fierce clashes on the Ukrainian front lines. Russian troops began to lose one by one the territories that they previously captured. At the same time, Ukraine does not disrupt its activities towards the Crimean Peninsula. Crimea, which has the key to end the war, will always hang at one end of the Ukraine war. It is also clear that the Russian troops could not resist the Ukrainian attacks, both on the front lines and behind the front lines. But can Russian troops reverse this situation? The Ukrainian army dealt another heavy blow to Vladimir Putin while Russia's total invasion attempt and attack against Ukraine continue. The stuff of the invading Russian army continues to be neutralized in Ukraine. Another rank Russian general was neutralized this week in Zaporizhia in the second phase of the massive Ukraine offensive. The Kremlin is quiet. Stunning details and our incredible tramps at the front are in the details. At the moment, we see that the most critical line of the front is the line of conflict between Zaporizhia and Donetsk. An incredible video emerged of troops raiding Russian positions as Ukraine attacked for areas. Ukrainian troops liberated the critical village of Blahardain, east of Zaporizhia. In the western Zaporizhia Oblast, Ukraine is reportedly making local gains in the regions southwest and southeast of Orykiv. According to Zaporizhia Oblast occupation official Vladimir Rogov, Ukraine is launching night attacks to take advantage of the three factors as the war continued at full speed. Another development took place that would upset Russian President Vladimir Putin. The Russian invaders were in a difficult situation along the line of contacts in the Donetsk and Zaporizhia regions. As a result of the Ukrainian offensive, according to information confirmed by Western and Russian intelligence, senior Russian Major General Sergei Goryachev was killed during the conflict in the Zaporizhia region. The other day, Major General Sergei Goryachev, 52, Chief of Staff of the 35th United Arms Army, was killed as a result of a missile attack in the Russian-occupied Donetsk region south of the village of Velika, Novosilka. While the Ukrainian army warned the villages with a counterattack, it was reported that the general who led the Russian troops in the same region was killed. The missile attack that hit the Russian general's base were Storm Shadow. So far British-made Storm Shadows have had 100% success in destroying major Russian bases in Luhansk. Berdyansk, Melitopol, and Mariupol. At least four more Russian generals have been killed since the start of the war last February. The latest reported death comes days after Ukraine launched and counteroffensive aimed at recapturing territory captured by Russian forces during the full-scale invasion. As of June second, at least four Russian generals, 58 colonists, and 176 lieutenant colonels had been killed in Russia's large-scale invasion of Ukraine according to the anti-Putin Russian news outlet Mediazona. This includes Major General Kanima, Major Major General Vladimir Frolov, Major General Roman Kutuzov, and Major General Andrei Kotrovsky. Last month, the Russian Ministry of Defense reported that two Russian colonels were killed in a shootout near the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region. 
Goryachev graduated from the Ryazan Guards Higher Air Bornkum and School in 1994 and previously served in Transnistria and Tajikistan. After Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, he became the commander of the 5th Separate Tank Brigade and was promoted to deputy commander of the 35th Combined Arms Army, where he was appointed chief of staff. As the saying little about the escalation in Ukraine military actions for a week, President Zelensky confirmed the start of the counterattack on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday, Kiev forces conducted counterattack operations in at least four frontline areas, according to the Washington-based think tank. He reported that Ukraine's forest had made gains in the Bakhmut area, with the Ukrainian army advancing up to 1,400 meters in some areas. In addition, Russian sources also reported that Ukrainians operating in the Luhansk Oblast near Belohorivka and on Sunday afternoon and video appeared allegedly showing the liberation of the village of Blahardate in the Donetsk region. Before continuing our video, I would like to remind you again, if you are against the invasion of Ukraine and want to support the work we do with my team, you can like our video and comment and hit the super thanks button below. So with which tactics did Ukraine go towards an invincible victory in the great offensive that the Ukrainian forces have been carrying out for about two weeks? The UK's Ministry of Defense said in an assessment that Ukraine is making good progress in some areas where it has infiltrated the first line of Russian defense. The mod went into details about Russia's performance things. Russia's performance was mixed. The ministry noted that while some units were likely conducting reliable maneuvering, defensive operations. Others were retreating in some disorder amid growing reports that Russian casualties were rising as they retreated from their own minefields. By August last year, the British Ministry of Defense reported that 10 Russian generals had been killed. The cumulative effect on command consistency likely adds to Russia's tactical and operational challenges, the mod wrote. In other words, we can say that the cost of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine was extremely heavy for the Kremlin. The Ukrainian general staff claimed in May that the total number of Russian troops killed or wounded during its full-scale invasion of Ukraine exceeded 200,000. The figure means that Russia has lost a huge number of soldiers, currently estimated at 220,000. This figure surpasses all serving armed forces of many countries. As you may recall, only three NATO armies have more total regular troops than this number. The United States, Turkey and France, while the other 28 members all have fewer serving members. On the other hand, Ukraine focuses on night operations. In some regions, the goal is to reduce the efficiency of our aviation, avoid losses from the stun company's precision hits on kamikaze drones, and make the most of the benefits of using it. Western supplied equipment includes superior night optics, which gives Ukrainian forces a significant advantage over Russian forces. It was also shared that to support this stock, Zelensky received new military aid commitments during his meeting with visiting Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at the weekend. Ukraine, on the other hand, is leading its offensive to gain ground and inflict casualties with skilled infantry units, deliberate attacks, and small-scale offensive tactics. The long-awaited counteroffensive of the armed forces of Ukraine in the first week has so far been deliberate and methodical. It combined infantry drones and armored vehicles in targeted attacks against church range targets, usually no more than one or two forest lines or villages. Independent information sources and Russian military bloggers all agree that Kiev's top military leadership has so far followed the conservative strategy of eroding Russian formations over time, gradually gaining ground, avoiding major risks, and limiting Ukraine loses as much as possible after a slow pace offensive designed to keep Ukrainian casualties to a minimum. The Kremlin aims to defeat its troops locally. On the other hand, even pro-Russian sources admit that Ukraine's deliberate tactics and undeniable out-of-the-ordinary gaining ground, that Russian defense is under increasing pressure by following us in these difficult times, you are also helping Ukraine.